Yeah, I mean, I, what just on that on that note, I mean, I I, I rant about that quite a, quite a bit actually on social media. I always say the idea of saying, "Do you know a good copywriter?" and expecting to get the right person come to you is a bit like saying, "I'm making a film. Do you know a good actor?" Hello and welcome to the Six Star Leaders podcast. I am your host, Aveline Clark, and you're about to listen to another incredible conversation with an amazing human all about how they are making a difference in the world using passion, purpose, and their alignment of their genius. It's going to be good. They always are. Enjoy. My guest this week is with James Daniel. He's a creator, a writer, and he's lived a life of creativity and following his passion and his genius. I, I just feel that having a guest like James on the podcast was is just so f- refreshing for those of us who are in the depths of a business that might not be aligned with our genius or where we're not aligned with the work that we do in some way, but also to get an insight into what it means to be to- constantly creating and being in tune with that creation and it's an alchemical process and it is the act of it's the process itself. James is a master at his craft. He's very respectful. He's delightful. He's got an amazing history and journey and and there's a lot to, I guess, take from this and especially for me it was that we're all creators being entrepreneurs and we can learn from from James in many ways. I also loved his take on ChatGBT and the nature of AI and how he's responding to that. So, yeah, dig in. Enjoy this one with James Daniel. Hello and welcome. It is Six Star Podcast. I am here with my guest today, James Daniel. James, welcome. It is so good to have you here. Thank you. Uh, yes. Good morning. Well, good evening for you. We're uh, on opposite sides <laughs> of the world, aren't we? So <laughs> we are. It's really lovely to have you here, and um, I've been looking forward to having you here and talking more about your your gift, your genius, and everything you do. Um, well, let's get started, shall we? You've kind of given it away as to where you might be. You're certainly on the opposite <laughs> side to where I am in Australia, down under. Whereabouts yeah. are you, James? Um, so I, I'm in the UK, um, in uh, the rainiest part of South Wales. Um, so uh, yeah, I've, I've lived here most of my life, um, and uh, yeah, kind of settled, settled here. We've got a lot of building work going on outside, so I hope it doesn't uh, <laughs> doesn't make too much difference. Where where is the, the rainiest part of Wales? Um, it's in it's in the sort of south area. I'm, I'm about a um, uh, couple of miles outside Cardiff. Okay. So they, they call it the valleys. I'm I'm sort of in the, the southern bit of the valleys and um it's it's quite legendary for um uh, for its terrible weather. <laughs> With the exact opposite of you in Australia. So you know you, you have the scorching sun all of the time as far as we're concerned from watching neighbours and things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's we, funny. We've yeah. had two days of summer this year. So. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um I mean, there's so many things I could ask you, but look, I did go to Wales for the first time last year and mm. uh, it was beautiful. Uh, the energy there was really very different to the UK and other parts that I'd been to around. Like, you know, I've, I've been to Ireland, I've got relatives in Ireland, but yeah, mm. it was a beautiful, crisp, clean, raw energy I found yeah. in Wales. Where, whereabouts did you go in Wales? Yeah, we we went to Cardiff and we stayed with a couple of friends there and and then we went down to um, oh, where is it? Near the near the beach. Um, it, it's got a very weird name. Um, Panas, Barry Island. Um, it'll come to me. I've been put on the spot. Uh, there, there are some very weird names, and we visited a lot of castles and um, Ogmore, Ogmore by the sea. Oh, Ogmore, okay, yes, yes, I know Ogmore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you so, get to Capri Castle? I think we did, yes, and it rained suddenly. Of course, yes, a couple of times, yes. <laughs> so I, I, I grew up with a view of Caerphilly Castle from my bedroom window, and I didn't actually go there until I was sixteen. So <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things. It's a world class tourist attraction, but you just take it for granted. You know, I'm sure there are people who who can see the Leaning Tower of Pisa from their window and uh, and just never never go there. You know. So. Yeah, very true. 
Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. I didn't realize you were in Wales. So there we go. And uh, yeah, beautiful time that I had there. Well, this is about you. And now I'd like to get to know you a little bit better. So could you share with me like what it what is it that, what is it that you do and who do you serve? Yeah, so I'm a, a copywriter, a uh, freelance, which I've been doing for um, the last uh, 17, nearly 18 years. Um, and I work with I, I work with clients um, sort of all over the world. And I, I, I'm loath to say anyone with a pulse, which is very often the way that the freelancers sort of, you know, will take what comes along. Um, I've worked with many different types of client, large corporations, uh, you know, some high street names and, um, you know, some governments government bodies, big charities. I actually prefer working with small business owners. Um, my my ideal is is working with um, the owner operator of somebody who's built, you know, someone who's built something from scratch and is still working at the coal face, but is starting to plan for their retirement. So they want to start to optimize everything. Um, they want to build a better marketing system so they can spend less time um, firefighting Oh, so right, so they, they can spend more time fixing the things that they're firefighting because they, they don't have to sort of spend all of their days worrying where the next sale is coming from. Um, and they can start to, you know, plan the succession of the business. That's that's sort of um, where I think I found a, a niche. It's not so much about what, what kind of business they're in. It's more about the situation of the owner. And I find that, you know, when you're dealing with the owner, you, you don't have to go through endless tears of getting sign off as you do with a corporation or, or worse a charity um and I, I i think that they they don't get overly sort of um analytical about the about every sort of word of it because that's my job you know they don't try to second guess you know is this the right syllable and so on um because they tend to understand look this is a message that we're going to put out into the marketplace we're going to test it because there's, there's no, as you know, there's no way of knowing. You can use all the best practice in the world, but you do not know whether something is going to fly or not. All you can do, you know, I always say marketing is like um, digging for treasure when you're writing your own map as you go along, <laughs> you know, where you're sort of, uh, you put something out there, you put a spade in the ground. If it, if, it, if it works, then great. You know, you've got something to work with. If not, you strike that off and say, that didn't work. What can we learn from it? Move to the next thing and so on you know um and i find that it's that category of small business owner <clears throat> that tends to be most likely to appreciate that process yeah. well wow, it's so it's so interesting because we all all business owners need copywriting at, mm. at various times and my experience is there's different types and so i, I know that we're going to get into that a bit more but you mentioned already that you've been doing this a long time and mm. i'd love to know about your journey i mean here on the podcast i always ask my guests about their journey because you, your journey really helps uh, define not just define the the key moments that have brought you to where you are today but it highlights the value that you bring and what you value in the mm. work that you do so um yeah i'd love to love to hear about your journey that you've been on um, to bring you to this place. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I'll try and cut a long story sort of shortish, you know. But uh, I mean, it, it, I, I, fundamentally, I'm a writer, and that's that, that's kind of who I am, you know. Um, I, I think if you're a writer, you know, you're a writer. You know, you you have a compulsion. And I, I picked up a pen when I was eight years old and started writing poems and limericks and rewriting song lyrics and you know th things like this. Um, and uh, you know, a little bit older then, so in my teens, I was writing plays and uh, you know, getting my class to perform them in our school drama class and things like this. Yeah, um, all I knew was I, that I wanted or even needed to write. You know, um, I, I, I was always sort of a very sort of stay at home type um, outside of the cricket season. Anyway, you know, you couldn't get me outdoors. I'd, I'd just be sort of uh, just stuck in my room writing the whole time, um, and. Um, the the result of that, I mean, like everything I wrote was garbage, you know, for, for the first sort of ten years or so. It was, it might have been promising, but it was it was basically garbage. But the result of it was that by the time I was nineteen, I was actually starting to make a living, you know. So I, I went to university in London um, to UCL to do a degree in linguistics. Um, quick sort of aside there. What what I found, what I realised through a sort of a fairly painful process is that my brain works in a very particular sort of way. Um, I have a, a natural flair for anything to do with language. 
um, and I am absolutely useless at sciences. Um, so um, it, it took me, you know, my, I had teachers screaming at me saying, look, you're the only child in the school who achieves th at this level who can't sort of, you know, achieve all round in every subject. What's going on? Are you just not trying? You know, why is it that in one set of exams you've had 96 in French and 25 in biology? You know, what on earth is going on? Um, and I, I eventually came to the conclusion that, you know, there's a bit of my brain that, that works much better than, better than the rest of it, you know. Um, so I did a, a degree in linguistics, um, and um, which is all about sort of the psychology of language. What does what does language tell us about the components of the human brain? It's about communication, you know, the the process of semantics and pragmatics. You know, if what I I will say something I'm implying, and then you're inferring using the same information using different processes, um, as well as you know how a child acquires language, that sort of thing, and that that process of of um, pragmatics of inference. Um, probably interested me more than anything else within um, within my degree and I kind of parked it and it became very useful to me later on as a copywriter because you're communicating and making sure that people correctly infer um but yeah so one um, coming coming back to the sort of the, the timeline um all the way through university I was writing I was trying my hand at literally everything I was doing stand-up comedy you know um and I, was, I was terrible I'm absolutely terrible. There's a, a famous um, uh, place in London called the Comedy Store, um, and they have an open mic night. And, you know, what I should have been doing is, is going along with some really sort of low-key venues and just sort of, you know, getting up in two minutes and trying it out. But I always had this tendency to jump in at the deep end. So uh, I booked an open mic slot at the Comedy Store. It's the first time I've ever done stand-up. I was 19 years old, and at the time I looked about 12. And it's two o'clock in the morning, a really aggressive audience. A guy called Jerry Sadovitz, a very aggressive comedian, had just come on and the audience was riled. And I come on looking looking like I'm 12 and they just ate me alive. I mean, it was it was horrible. Um, but I went back. I kept going back time and time again. And, it, you know, one time they started to laugh and then I forgot what I was going to say and I had to make things up. And it was, it was just one disaster after another. Um, but I kept going back. Uh, and the, the last time I did it, I nailed it. And um, I, thought, I wasn't expecting to, but I thought, that's it. I'm never doing this again. <laughs> I've done it now, you know. Um, but the the great thing from that is I will stand up now in front of any audience with or without a script. Um, you know, I, I do. Um, my family has turned me into the official sort of um, person to do eulogies at funerals. And um, I, I was asked to do one spontaneously at, uh, at an auntie's funeral a couple of years. They forgot to ask me. So I sort of, can you just say a few words, you know? Um, but that's fine, you know, because I, I, as a result, I've, ha I've had the worst possible experience in front of an audience. So literally nothing will phase me now. Doesn't matter how big the audience is or whether I'm prepared, you know? Um, and I'd recommend that to anybody. Because the, the 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 sort of the immunization that you get from it is amazing. Um yeah, so I was I was trying my hand at literally everything. Um I was um directing um plays and you know in the in the London Fringe Theatre and uh, and just trying to find that, that 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 sort of overlap between this interests me and it turns out I'm actually quite good at it. Not really thinking, can I make some money from it? I was just trying to find the things that interested me. Um and um yeah so the time went by I, I ended up working on radio um on um we have a, a station here bbc radio five uh when that launched they had youth programs from the region regions every night and um our show was hosted by a guy who's since gone on to become a big star in the uk a guy called rob bryden um and i, I used to do a five minute slot on on that show every week and um but um, yeah, so it was, it was still very kind of, I was basically a nomad, just sort of looking around, what am I doing here, trying to figure out what, what was what. In the meantime, I met my wife uh, in 1993, uh, and we, we were married within a year of meeting each other. Uh, it was just sort of one of those love at first sight things. We're still together nearly 30 years old. Um, and um, so I had to sort of think, okay, I've got to get a job. I've got to actually make some money from this now. Uh, and I took a job as a journalist. Um, which I hated. I absolutely hated. Um, you know, I, I was doing really banal things like, you know, chasing minor celebrities to get their opinions on things that they had no right to have an opinion on. 
on, you know, on the, where, where they, their opinion was worthless. Um, and I, I did it for two years. The money was rubbish. Um, the, the hours were miserable. Um, so I walked out of there in the end and um, I, I took a job um, selling cable TV door to door. Now, th this is relevant. Um, so by this time, I had settled on what I wanted to do, which was I wanted to be a, a sitcom writer. I want, wanted to write TV shows and you know, radio and, and just sort of spend my life doing that. Um, so I thought, okay, I, I, if I just do something else to make some money, I can spend my energy sort of writing what I want to write. Um, and you know, sure enough, selling cable TV, you know, you're just knocking doors, sometimes in the rain, sometimes getting smoke blown in your face and getting chased by dogs. But nonetheless, it's it, you know, all you're doing really is talking to people about their favorite TV programs, getting them to sign up for a package. Quite an easy job. Um, and uh, getting paid three times as much as I had before. So that was great. Meantime, the BBC are interested in a sitcom that I've written. Um, things progressed very quickly then in the late 90s. So I ended up being seconded to our head office uh, and doing a 250-mile commute every day um, because they they wanted me to join their marketing team. And, um, and at the same time, I got my sitcom commissioned. Uh, so this was a show I'd co-written with, with two other guys. Um, so suddenly things are really starting to happen. I thought, this, is, this is brilliant. You know, the sitcom spent a year in development. Um, we went through 18 drafts of it. You know, they were going to sort of try it like that. No, that didn't work. Try that and so on. Um, and um, I, I hated the end result. So it's out there. It's on YouTube. You know, it's, um, it's called Hang the DJ. Um, if you if you search for it, you'll find an episode of Black Mirror that came a few years later. But um, uh, it, it's um, <clears throat> it is out there, um, and I think that it, it went through that writer's process of development hell, where um, uh, they they try so hard to sort of uh, optimize it, you know, the, the the script that they lose all that was good about it. Um, it bits of it didn't make sense. I fell out with the producer. It was it was a horrible experience. Um, so, um, but, you know, we, we did another show for radio a year later that I was a lot happier with, but the process of development hell really put, you know, put me off for a while. Um, and, um, you know, in the meantime, <clears throat> I'm now running business development for, um, uh, for this cable company I'm working for. Um, and that's, that's really taking off. So the next five years really is just all about that. I'm now a father, you know, um, and, uh, and, and it's just work. Um, and then suddenly the job came to an end. Um, so it's 2005 and I'm I, I, I sat talking to a recruitment consultant who's looking at my CV. He said, you're 36, 37 years old. And this looks like I'm talking to two 30 year olds. You know, what are you? Are you this creative type? Are you this sort of uh, sales guy, marketing guy, business development? You know, yes, you've, got, you've done an awful lot of stuff. But there's no consistency here whatsoever. I mean, it says on my website, I've had more jobs than Homer Simpson. You know, it, it's, it's just, it's quite ridiculous. Um, so copywriting was the only thing that made sense. I did a lot of sort of, you know, soul searching. What's, what am I going to do? It combined the creative part and the strategic, uh, the strategic thinking, the sales training and so on. It brought all of that together. Um, and it, it just felt like a natural fit. And sure enough, I did a, a, a one year access course in 12 weeks and, and thought, yeah, okay, this is, this is me, you know, this is, you know, um, it, it certainly wasn't where I saw my life going, but actually everything has, I didn't know it, but everything's been leading up to this, you know? Uh, and I, I think it, curiously, my wife went through a similar process in her mid thirties. She'd been running a, a virtual assistant business and then decided, came to me one day and said, I've decided I want to be an occupational therapist. <laughs> um, I think there's something about being in your mid thirties where you've kind of fallen into a career. You've taken it so far. You've had a chance to take stock. You've got a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of self-awareness and you start to think, um, okay, now I, I have some perspective on where I'm going. You know, um, I was talking yesterday to a life coach who said that, um, they speak to a huge amount, huge number of people in their mid to late thirties who are going through that exact same thing. It's and I, I find that absolutely fascinating that that you know we all have that. 
um, it used to be you choose your career and that's what you do for your entire life. You know, and I think we all have multiple careers now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, the, the upshot is, you know, I, I got a, a qualification in copywriting, uh, straight away set up my own agency. Um, and since then, I've, you know, I've worked with 300 clients um, around the world. Um, won awards, uh, my award's not visible. I always put it in the background where people can see it. Um, <laughs> um, won a big award from the Chartered Institute of Marketing for a direct mail campaign and, um, you know, various success stories. But um, it, it's something I've been able to, to sort of commit to. And, you know, the other writing is still there. You know, recently I've set up a, you know, I, I, I brought out a children's book in 2010 that took me 25 years to finish. And uh, recently I've set up a, a business called Tell It Your Way on the side, which is um, for um, personalized children's books. So we, um, you know, we put the uh, an avatar into the book that looks like the child and then we sort of you know, personalize the text and so on. So still got all of that going on. I haven't sort of abandoned the other creative um, ambitions, but when you're running a busy copywriting business, you have to sort of find the time to to, to do all of that, you know. And that brings me to where I am now. So, you know, at, at 54 that I am now, um, you know, I've, I've got 35 years behind me as a professional writer with, the, with about half of that in copywriting. And uh, it's been a long, long journey, hopefully not too boring a story, but, uh, you know, along the way, uh, I've, I've learned a lot about who I am. And, you know, I think we all have to go through that kind of process of, of self-reflection and, and you know um a bit of navel gazing just to sort of find some happiness in what we do you know? thank you james uh what a great story what an amazing journey uh, especially the, the the inflection point in your mid-30s when the the recruitment person is saying but hang on you know there's two 30 year olds here who, who the yeah. hell are you you know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm the guy that's living multiple lives at the same time to, mm. you know, have a lot of fun and figure out, you know, what what's right for me. Mm. There's not, I don't see anything bad or wrong about that. I think it's great. Mm. I I really applaud people going out and and doing these things and and figuring out who they're not in order to know who they are. I mean, that yeah. sometimes that that's the process of elimination, right? Yeah, it's painful as you as you go through it because you can feel like. I have no idea where I'm heading. I just know that there's something driving me, but I don't. I can't articulate it. And it, it, it's that moment of clarity is there, but it, 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 it's a long time coming. Sometimes, you know. Mm. When you were talking about doing the stand-up comedy at the comedy mm. store in London, I had to chuckle. After the, so you were 19 when you started doing that. Is that right? Yeah. So what on earth drove you to go back, even though they totally ate you alive that first time? Did you not care that they ate you alive or was it, you know, were you challenged then to try and get on stage and make people laugh? Like was was there this internal desire to, I'm going to I'm gonna conquer this, you know? So what, what happened? I mean, I, I think that um, I I was too naive to, to, to have fear, I think, was, was probably, and, and perhaps a little bit too confident as well. And uh, so I thought, well, something didn't work there, but there's nothing fundamentally wrong with me. You know, I know now I'm terrible at stand-up, but, you know, at the time. Um, but what I found was, um, so the first one I did was at the end of my first year in uni, and I came back home to, um, to Wales for the summer, and I worked with a comedy troupe in Cardiff um, for that for that time, and I worked on some of their shows and did some stand-up there. And doing the same material in Cardiff, it went down really, really well. And I actually found over the years, provincial audiences were much friendlier than London audiences. You know, London audiences at the time in the late 80s were really horrible. You know, they were sort of, okay, come on and make me laugh, you know, fold your arms and sort of go, you know. And, and a lot of them went in there deliberately to sort of, uh, you know, give the act a hard time. It was confrontational. That's fine. That's what it was. Um, so I went... Um, went away, sort of, you know, had a couple of good gigs, and there's nothing, there is no better feeling than when a stand up session goes well. You know, it, it's, you, you're just right at the top of the world, you know. Um, so I thought, okay, let's go back, let's see if I can conquer the comedy store again, you know, and again and again. So I was determined that it, it, it has to work. That kind of, I, I don't want to sort of, you know, make this a, a sort of, you know, overstate what this was, but. The Edison principle of inventing the light bulb, of celebrating every failure because it gets you one step closer, 
but knowing that there is a success coming. I knew that I would get it at least sort of to a point where I'm not being booed off stage, you know, at least where I'm getting some laughs and so on. And that was sort of what I was aiming for. And when that happened, I thought I've, I've satisfied this. But also that night, I, it was the first night I saw a couple of comedians who um, are now quite famous in, in the UK, people like Alan Davis, who you may know of, um, saw him for the first time. And I thought I could do this for a thousand years and I will never be anywhere near as good as this guy. There is absolutely no point. I'm a good writer. I'm a very, very poor stand-up comedian. Focus on what you're good at, you know. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it, it's it's all part of the learning curve. Absolutely, and you've done so many different types of writing as well along the journey. Yeah. You know, what's been one of the you know toughest lessons or, or moments in that journey that you've had? Oh, um, I think it's the the realization that nobody has ever written anything that will be universally approved. You know, if if Shakespeare took Hamlet into um, into an agency, sort of, you know, um, and uh, or, or a production company, then you'd have people sitting around going, "I'm not sure about this to be or not to be thing." You know, um, people will always pick holes in things. Sometimes because they've something valid to say to, to bring to the table, but unfortunately, more often because they want to be seen to have an opinion. And you have to be, um, as a writer, you have to be quite um, disciplined in the way that you accept feedback. So with the, with the sitcom that I mentioned, for example, um, we would have been better off taking draft four into studio because that was that was good. But they they kept on chipping in and messing it up and draft 18 was was nowhere near as good. Um, and it's that that process of useless feedback, if you like. But at the same time, you can't be so arrogant as to rise above feedback because, you know, we, we also got some great notes in, in, in there. You just have to be critical. Um, I mean, perhaps the best example of this I've ever seen. Um, I was um, I asked uh, a bunch of people at a, at a business network um, to give their opinion on some possible titles for a training day that I was doing uh, with a videographer. We would say, okay, we, you're going to write and shoot a video script for your business, and um, you know there were various sort of titles there. So tell us which you like. Um, and in the end, we en- we ended up choosing "Shoot Me Now," which I thought was quite cool. Um, but one of them sort of, you know, said uh, something like, you know, um, your business video, something very, very basic like that. And somebody on their feedback sheet put, video is a very 1980s word. Now, apart from the <clears throat> several million YouTube searches, uh, or, you know, Google searches for, for YouTube videos every day, which makes that rubbish. Th- this is typical of rubbish feedback. You just choose a word and, and you choose a decade and you say, well, that's a bit of a 70s word, isn't it? You know? And so this, this was somebody who had no opinion but felt they needed to think of something. And this happens far too often in the, in the creative process. And the, the worst way that this happens is with Google Docs. I hate Google Docs with, with, with a passion. Okay, um, Because what happens is you get focus group syndrome where people feed off each other's ideas. Now, you have to think, if you're reviewing a piece of copy, um, you have to think about the environment in which people actually uh, digest that copy. Let's say it's a sales letter, for example. They are reading it, um, probably standing over the bin. Okay, So they, 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 they pick it up, it's fallen on their, their doorstep, they sort of open the envelope, they expect that they're going to throw it away, but they'll give it a little bit of a cursory glance. It is them and only them in a very sort of impatient mode. Okay. Um, so you have to make sure that, you know, the headline sort of screams out at them and it's easy to read and so on and so on. OK, um, they don't read it with a bunch of people around them saying, what about that bit? What about that bit? What about that bit? Um, and the, the point of that is you're only getting one person's response in, in the real world. Um, when you use Google Docs to review something like that and everybody's chipping in, then one person will raise a particular point, and then somebody else will jump on that and it will prejudice their own thoughts. It happens every single time. Um, and therefore, they they will send themselves down a rabbit hole. 
you know, the, the group will, will go down a rabbit hole that's that, that's that's invalid. Um, I saw this in, in that group exercise where I was asking them to to give feedback on names for uh, for, for the video event. Um, I asked I specifically asked everybody to sort of you know don't say anything just um, just write down what you think and I could start I could see people sort of you know writing positive comments about different things and so on okay and then one idiot goes I don't like any of these and suddenly people go oh hang on then. you know one person's prejudice uh, prejudice will um, or feedback will prejudice another always every single time um, and uh, I, I think that. We need to be very, very careful of that because you, you know, I've seen literally tens of millions wasted uh, as a result of this. So when I worked for the cable company, um, somebody in a focus group once mentioned, "Why should I trust you? I don't know who you are," um, and that got lots of other people going, "Oh yeah, yeah, I suppose so." Now I've been on the door, you know, I, I knocked at thousands of doors. And the, the issue of trust very rarely came up. We were a public utility. We were known. It wasn't really an issue on the doorstep. But in this focus group, it became a thing because the most vocal person in the room decided it was a thing and everyone latched onto it. Um, the result was an entire campaign that they called Trust Us, which was all about, you know, you can trust us because we, you know, we look after the phones for the fire brigade and 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 things like that, the Coast Guard trust us and, and so on. Now, a new marketing director thankfully came in and said, What on earth is this? You know, this is garbage. You know, somebody you say to somebody, trust me, and they think, why? Why can't I trust you? <laughs> you know. Um to, to to explicitly say trust us because is not the way to earn somebody's trust. But because of that bit of false feedback that sent the entire focus group down a rabbit hole they they wasted millions and millions of pounds on that campaign you know uh, and i see it on a small scale frequently working with with my own clients i've seen it on that massive scale it happens every time i i hate focus groups and i hate google talks feedback is great but isolated you know oh, what a great point and very very important um yeah, I, 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 my mind is going through to c- certain examples in my career as well, and I totally agree. Mm. You're a writer, um, obviously. Why do you write? Do you know, I don't know. Yeah? I do not know, apart from the fact that it's the only thing I'm good at. Um, <laughs> I Literally, it's a... It's a it's just a compulsion. I know that sounds pretentious, you know, sort of it chose me, I didn't choose it, you know, but but there is a truth in it. There's a story uh, that does the rounds on Facebook about um, the choreographer Gillian Lynn, um, you know, choreographed Cats, um, about when she was a child that her teachers were worried about her because she she wasn't knuckling down and she couldn't keep still. And they brought a, an educational psychologist in to uh, to observe her through a, a sort of two-way mirror. And when she thought she was on her own and not being watched, she got up and started dancing around the room and, and so on. And uh, and they realised, well, hang on, you know, this girl has an incredible talent. So it's not that she's stupid. It's that she's a dancer. This is who she is. This is what is driving her. And it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily to do with any external input. It's just who she is. Um, and it's part of that Einstein thing of everyone's a genius, but if you ask a fish to climb a tree, it'll think it's stupid. You know, we all have to find our thing. And I think that there is, in all of us, there is one thing that just fundamentally drives us that we didn't originally choose. You know, I, I, I think it's, I think that's why I'm a writer. You know, I, when I started writing, I didn't actually enjoy the process of writing, but I liked having written. I liked the end result. Um, I, I've come over the years to enjoy the process as well, but um, it was it was that compulsion to to see some some kind of completed work that was my own. And I guess particularly, you know, this was the 1970s, 1980s. You know, you couldn't produce your own things. It was very hard to sort of, um, you know, I, you could get a tape recorder and make your own sort of um, low key comedy programs. And of course, I did that. You know, um, there were no video cameras. You know, you couldn't sort of do your own sort of big epic productions, very few outlets for creativity for for children, you know, just the occasional school play if you're lucky. So the only outlet that I had was 
the things I could put on a sheet of paper. Um, and that, that's where I found my satisfaction. And you have to, you have to get it where you can find it, you know, and yeah. I, I, yeah. Mm. Um, what do you like most about writing? If you think about it, a typical day <clears throat> or a typical week mm. as a copywriter, what do you get the most joy from? Um, the biggest reward you can get, I think, is is knowing that um, something that you wrote has been successful. Um, so, you know, the I mentioned the, the award. Um, that was for a, um, a direct mail campaign selling hearing aids. Um, so, you know, we, we took an existing sequence and, uh, and we rewrote it, um, segmented the audience, uh, took them on a sort of a more linear journey um and um you know beat their old control sequence by 43 percent um and that you know the reward that you get from that is is just incredible you know and i've had a, other sort of similar instances you know a, um, a series of eight emails that made ninety six thousand pounds in the space of eight days th things like this but on a day-to-day -day basis you know clients don't always report back results you know they don't always necessarily measure results um there's something in the process itself as well. Um, I think it's the satisfaction of maximizing your talent in the day. Um, I'm going to give you another story, uh, not from me, a famous story about um, uh, a painter. Um, so every day, this man would see a painter sort of going, uh, going up to the top of a mountain, carrying an easel, looking very sort of... Um, not quite at one with himself, looking very sort of ill at ease. And then every day, at the end of the day, he would see that painter walking down the mountain with a big smile on his face. And eventually he asked him, you know, why, why, what's the difference? And he says, well, in the morning, I don't know yet that I can do it. You know, but when I have, then, you know, I'm happy. And I think, you know, there's that bit of self-doubt comes in, even no matter how well you've nailed your process. We're human beings and we're, you know, we are subject to our own sort of, you know, chemical imbalances and, you know, is something out of whack? Have we not slept? Have we not, you know, are we generally too tired because uh, we haven't taken a break for a while? Is something wrong? Can we do it today? You know, your best on one day is very different from the next. So it's knowing that I maximise what I can do today. That's that's where the satisfaction comes on a day-to-day -day basis. It's feeling that you've earned your cup of tea and an hour of TV or whatever it is that whatever your reward is at the end of the day, feeling that you've earned it. If, if I haven't done a good day's work, I feel like an imposter at the end of the day. And I hate that feeling. Absolutely hate that feeling. Yeah. So I, I think that's, that's the sort of the, the daily reward. You know? mm -hmm. How tied to that daily reward is the knowing that you've, impacted a person for the right reasons or for in the best possible way the the chance to help somebody grow their business is just phenomenal you know i i have more respect for entrepreneurs than pretty much any other sort of section of society you know people who just think i'm not going to let somebody else control my destiny i'm going to you know do my own thing shape this i believe in myself uh, I'm going to put this thing out there. And it's it's an incredible privilege for that person to choose you as the person who's going, going to grow this thing that is literally life or death to them, you know, or is survival to them, you know, that their, their family's future depends on uh, on it. Um, so just just being asked to do that is is amazing. And when you can see that you're making a difference in that person's business, of course, that's 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 incredible. And I think you have to sort of separate then, okay, is this a vanity thing of knowing that I, I did this and it was me and swagger that, that you get from that, which I think I used to have, you know, um, but really I think that the reward is just knowing that you've done something for that person. You, you know, they, they have taken a chance on building a better life for themselves and you've been part of that. That's, that is an amazing feeling when you can do that. Mm. Absolutely. Um, 
What's really interesting, I I need to share with you what's coming up for me and and why I'm kind of a little bit stunned is that as you've been talking, I realise I'm hearing all of this from a man who is living his creative genius, who discovered it at a young age and who is going through a natural creative process every day, not for the sake of an external outcome, but for the sake of doing the process itself. And that inherently is the creative process. And I think for someone like me who works with businesses and we talk about purpose and impact and having a greater meaning, sometimes that greater meaning is simply the act of doing the process itself and being in service to that gift that you have. Not all not all of us have that kind of a gift that we get to use every day. And I just want to highlight that and kind of hold up a bit of a, a, a mirror or a light, James, and just sort of thank you for sharing so eloquently the journey, how you do your work, because it's really been illuminating for me to hear this from from someone who yeah it is is a master but a true master at their crea- their craft um it's not something that you chose like you did you chose to be a daughter or salesman for the cable company but actually you are inherently a a creator mm-hmm. it's just beautiful it's really fascinating my mind's still processing it's still buzzing with this you know, wow, this is a whole new lens on, you know, being in business and, and how this, how how can we as as people just take a little little bit of what you're what you've got? You know, how can we learn from that? Yeah. Yes, I mean I I think it, it's I, I I'm probably reflecting on this more than I normally do, to be honest with you. And sort of I I'm actually revealing to myself a little bit about sort of why I do what I do as, as I'm saying this. I'm kind of articulating for the first time. Um but yes, I mean I I, I think it's a, it's about multiple drivers as well. You know, like one thing for me, I'm uh, yeah, I mentioned earlier as a child I didn't didn't sort of go out much. I'm the same as an adult. In fact, I'm quite a bit worse now. You know, I'm almost acrophobic these days. You know, I I I haven't left this room very much in 18 years, you know. Um, but that suits me. That's again part of what what sort of you know fits my purpose. You know, I I I cannot work in an open plan office. I have to have complete um silence and solitude in order to do to do my best job. I could make a much better living, you know. I look, I, I make a good living as a copywriter, but I could make a much better living. You know, uh, taking a job in you know in a marketing department or um, you know, in a big corporation, um, or or going back into sales even. But it's all about finding that purpose and finding the balance of you know this this suits me financially and it gives me satisfaction and it it meets that underlying need which for me is I like I say I can't be out in the world on a day to day basis. It, it's you know but just satisfies my inner hermit <laughs> you mentioned before early on in y- your journey I think maybe around the time you're at university uh and you were looking at you know what are you really good at what are you best in the world and what's going to give me money for that um mm-hmm. made me think about the ikigai um you know the, the Japanese model of the four circles and that intersection of those have you looked at that before um no I haven't no. Yeah, it's it's something um, that's been fairly new to me in the last year, I guess, a couple of years. And more and more, I I guess when I'm speaking with my guests on the, on the podcast, I'm I'm hearing that they're kind of figuring that out without realizing or or knowing about the ikigai. And that's really just a, a, that intersection of you know what brings me joy and meaning. You know, in other words, what do I love doing? What 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 are people willing to pay me for? What does the world need? Uh, what am I best in the world at? And that intersection of the four. And it feels, it sounds to me like you've just nailed it. You know, you've figured all those things out and that's where you're mm-hmm. sitting in the middle. And it's not about making the most amount of money at all because you're in service to the gift that you have. Mm-hmm. And you've obviously figured out the process and, and the routine and the uh, the, the, the mantra the, the, is it the, the what's there's there's got to be like a 
the act of service to that on a daily basis. Like you said, if you haven't got to the point of your day where you feel like you've earned your hour in front of the TV or whatever it is, yeah. you know, you don't feel good. Um, yes. Yeah. And it's a, it's a beautiful description, really is. Words have meaning and they have power. Um, and as business owners, we know that because we're all, we're all sold to in some way. Copywriting is not just about selling; it's about creating. Well, tell me, tell me, tell me in your words then what copywriting is, because I'm just going to come at it from my, you know, my view of the world. I want to hear from you. It's because different yeah. types of copywriting too, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, I mean, the, the difference between brand copywriting and direct response copywriting is is, is vast. It always amazes me when um, you know somebody will say on Facebook, "Does anyone know a good copywriter?" Uh, and then people just throw out a name, regardless. They, they don't find anything out about the job. You know, a brand copywriter ask them to write a, a direct mail series, and they would be all at sea, and vice versa. You know, I'm terrible at naming things. You know, I, I I I don't have the patience to go through that process. You know, but the the branding side is just not me. You know, um, so you know, different copywriters will come from different backgrounds. It it attracts um, English literature graduates um, and burns out salesmen in equal measure. <laughs> you know, so uh, radically different people. Um, so yeah, I, I what just on that on that note. I mean, I. I, I rant about that quite a, quite a bit actually on social media. I always say the idea of saying, do you know a good copywriter and expecting to get the right person come to you is a bit like saying, I'm making a film. Do you know a good actor? You know, you know, well, what's the role? What does it require? The idea that any copywriter can do any job. It's like, you know, you try casting Robert De Niro as Little Red Riding Hood. It's not going to sit well. You know, it's not going to work. It's the same in copywriting. Um, Yes, a good copywriter can adapt adapt their skills. Um, you know, I like to think, I, well, I mean, I've, I've not come up against an industry that I can't write for. Um, and, you know, I've been able to write most types of copy, but there are some things that I'm far more, where I can add far more value than, than, than others. Coming back to the question, though, you know, what, what is copywriting? Um, there are a million definitions flying around. I, I, I like the original, which is salesmanship in print. Um, you know, of, of selling from the page but i i think that copywriting is grossly misunderstood not just by most people but actually by most most people who have the word copywriter on their business card because unfortunately you know we're an unregulated industry i know an, an awful lot of very very good copywriters but there are some rogues and cowboys out, out there sort of plaguing the industry um and a lot of people kind of think, yeah, yeah, I'm a copywriter. I can write, therefore I can write copy without bothering to even read a book on the subject, let alone get some proper training. Um, I, I always remember um, when I started out, an agency uh, that I knew um, who said, yeah, well, we're a full service agency. We do everything. Yeah, we'll write your copy, everything. Um, and then I talked to them about how I approach things. And they said, I don't think we should write copy anymore <laughs> because they had never given any thought to the process to, to sort of, you know, the, how, how you research um, uh, copy to find sort of, you know, who's, who's the, uh, the ideal customer and what are their pain points, even the basic stuff like that. Um, uh, and then, you know, how you'd structure a message and how you intersect it with, you know, well, you know, where in that person's life are we, uh, are they coming into the, uh, hitting the message? what's the follow through you know the the, the sequencing of the of the message um they hadn't given any thought to that let alone the mechanics of direct response you know the sort of um the, the persuasion secrets and uh um you know those those little changes the little hinges that can swing big doors that can make a difference to conversion um most people who call themselves copywriters have no clue about any of this i don't think there's a copywriter alive who knows everything about the subject or even anything close to it but there are an awful lot who know literally nothing about it uh, which I, I i think is a crying shame because there are so many brilliant copywriters out there and they're all in the same line for consideration as the rogues and numpties and um you know it's it's frustrating for copywriters but more importantly it's frustrating for clients you know, and, and there also there's, there's a disorientation not just around quality, 
because there's so much BS, you know, but also around pricing. Because, you know, if, if you if you say, right, I need a, a 10 page website and you speak to four copywriters, one of them might quote you two or three hundred pounds if you go on Fiverr or Upwork or something like that. Yeah, it'll be rubbish and you'd be better off writing it yourself. But they'll say, you know, you go, oh, that's cheap. Why do you think it's so cheap? Um, another one might cut, might quote you ten or twenty thousand pounds if you go to sort of you know somebody with a bit of a, a reputation on a waiting list, you know. Um, and then in the middle, you know, somebody might quote you four or five thousand. But because there's so much discrepancy there. And there, and the the notion of quality is subjective, and uh, you know, people don't look at measurement. Um, then anybody who charges more than the cowboys is seen to be expensive, and that's really frustrating for, uh, as I say, not just for copywriters, but it it can be dangerous for customers, very very dangerous because they're putting they're wasting time and money and potentially risking their own reputation as well by putting bad copy into the marketplace. Um, so yeah I'm, I'm not sure I answered the original question though, but <laughs> well I, I I don't know either but um I, I'm with you totally agree and uh having you know run an agency myself before and dealt with marketers copywriters you know for 15 years mm-hmm. uh, I fully understand all of what you just said what I've what I've found over the years is that many business owners do lump copywriting in under the one banner, and they have a view that oh, writing's easy, you know. And they'd come and say, "Well, we want a lovely website," and they focus on the visuals. They focus on, you know, just the flashy thing. You know, give give us this flashy funnel. Great, have you got the copy? And they are no, but can you just write? Can you just write that for us? Yeah. Well. You know, and then and then there's the we say, well, we can get that done for you by someone that does this properly. And here's here's the quote. And then there's like this jaw-dropping moment when they go, Well, hang on, how can that be so expensive? How do you respond to that when th- there might be that sort of level of ignorance or or unawareness that copy is is that valuable? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean that, that- the first thing, just to echo what you said there about, you know, that it's always an afterthought. Uh, and that's so frustrating because it needs to be planned in right at the start. And, you know, particularly with, say, websites is where this happens the most. And every good developer I know will will always say, you know, you need to bring the copywriter in now because they will be part of not just sort of, um, you know, they don't just write the words. They will help us to develop the site map. They'll, you know, they'll be part of the keyword research and, uh, you know, deciding what we're doing with SEO. Um, they will help us to agree the wireframes because they should be part of determining the size and shape of the message and, and so on. Um, so it's it's absolutely vital to get the copywriter in. But to to come back to that, then um, the the issue of seeing value. Um, sometimes you can be um, just banging your head against the wall, and there are some people who will never see that uh, the importance. You can you can give them every intellectual argument that you like. But fundamentally, they will think, well, all you're doing is sort of, you know, taking words out of the dictionary and mixing them up a bit. But, you know, what's so difficult about that? Um, because they don't understand the process. And and you're not going to convince those people. And I, it took me a long time to realize that some people cannot be persuaded to a certain thing. Yeah. Um, so those people, I, I just say, look, you know, here's a copy of my book. Have a look at that. Write it yourself because you're better off. If you're not going to invest properly in copy, then don't invest in it at all. Don't take the cheap writer. You're better off learning a few sort of basics and doing your own. Um, and I, I think as a result of that, what I've tended to do is, is find the right sort of hunting grounds, uh, for want of a better word. Um, there are some places where you will only find people with that poverty mindset who don't appreciate the value of copy. And who can't be educated to it, um, and you have to walk away from those places. But there are other places where um, people absolutely appreciate it. They're invested in growing their business. They're invested in personal development. They understand the, the power of marketing, and they will pay you properly for copy. So, all of the best clients that I've had outside of you know a couple of trophy clients, if you like, from the corporate world, um, have come from 
from that environment. Um, and you know, usually they, they are people who follow one or two um, authority figures. I'm not talking about sort of guru fanboys who just sort of go along, listen to everything, and then do nothing. I'm talking about sort of the the top tier of of, of their followers who actually use the information and put it into action and, and use it to grow um, much bigger businesses. Working for those people um, for me has been brilliant. So um, you know, I've I've um, had a, as a few of my clients have been the authority figures themselves. Um, so to be writing for that figure means that all of their disciples, if you like, sort of um, are lining up then to hire you. So that that's been a a, a really important part of my business: being mm. in the right place with the right people who have the mindset for it. Yeah, you know, salespeople all re- all know that you know you, you there's that old adage in sales of you know you could sell ice to an Inuit, you, you know, I think is now the correct word. Um, if you're trying to do that, then you're not a salesperson because you're 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 going after the wrong the wrong audience. Sales a good salesperson knows that it, your audience selection comes first. So true. Great, great um insight there. I'd I'd love to ask you about AI and chat GPT and people's obsession now with you know using this for everything you obviously would this, this is probably like one of the big kind of you know new things that's come into the marketplace in your career and mm. I, I hear people you know saying oh easy just just create your web copy with chat gbt just create your emails with chat gbt how how what do you think about it? How do you respond to it? And what can you speak say about it to the listeners now? So I I know a number of copywriters who love it um, because they use it to write a first draft. Um, uh, you know, pretty much every copywriter will say don't don't use it for what it is because you know what it spews out is really bland. You know as well as being generic, because all it can do, it's, it's a digital parrot. All it can do is scrape content from, from other people's websites and repeat it back to you. Um, so, yes, there, there are many copywriters who say, you know, great, it'll kill the blank page. Um, you know, it'll, it'll help you to come I, up with I, ideas. I, and I, I was excited like when I first heard tried it, it repeatedly, but I um, hate it, with, and I prefer my own with sort of analog process. Um, and the um, reason for that is I hate it. Um, partly because... It's dumbing down standards, and partly because I think it, it poses a, a real threat to our info system. So I take those two things separately. So the, the standards thing, first of all, um, and yet I know I know I've seen a lot of copywriters go out of business as a result of this. I personally don't mind that one day a machine will come along that can do my job better than me, and I'll have to do something else, or I'll have to find other ways of adding value to my clients by doing things that the machines can't. You know, if you're being chased by a Dalek, you run upstairs, you do something the machine can't do, you know. So, you know, find other ways of adding value. Um, that's fine. I accept that's coming, but chat GPT is not it. I I will be replaced happily by a good robot, but not by a bad one. Um what I say to anybody who is thinking of using chat GPT is think of your own specialist subject yeah so we have a program in the uk called mastermind where it's a sort of quiz thing where you can sit in a big chair and they say right what's your specialist subject they'll ask you lots of questions about it all right so what would be your subject if you went on mastermind ask chat gpt to set you a quiz on that subject and see what it comes back with and you will realize it hasn't got a clue so um my pet subjects are West End Theatre, uh, sitcoms and Wimbledon. Okay. Uh, I have a, an incredibly sort of nerdy uh, knowledge level about these things. Okay. So I said, sent me um, 20 questions on West End Theatre. With 13 of them, it gave the wrong answer. And some of this was really basic stuff like, like the location of different venues. One of them, it claimed that the London Palladium was on Shaftesbury Avenue, which is about a mile away from where it actually is. So it's not even close, you know? Um, But also what I noticed is it takes um, opinion as fact. So um, it said, for example, 
who is the king of the West End? And it, the answer it gave was Andrew Lloyd Webber, because it's found an article that says Andrew Lloyd Webber is undoubtedly the king of the West End. That's somebody's opinion, and it's taken it. It hasn't fact-checked. It's just gone, oh, right, okay, so he's the king of the West End, isn't he? Now, you know, when you extrapolate that, the fact that it is willing to take one bit of opinion that it finds and claim that as fact is really dangerous. Yeah. Um, it, it also, um, it, it, uh, with, with facts as well, it will, it's very happy to find something that's incorrect and not fact check it, not look any further and say, well, I found that it must be true. Yeah. It's like somebody said, well, the bloke said down the pub. So I reckon that's gotta be it. You know, um, you know, it, it doesn't. It doesn't bother to look any further. It's it's a lazy researcher. Um, now, obviously, it can improve, but at the moment, I wouldn't trust it for anything. Yeah, you know, because you know, all right, if you're writing it for something that you know about or your client knows about, then theoretically, you should be able to eke out all of those errors. But why bother? If it's not speeding up your research process, if it's going to, you know, you're going to have to go back and forth, and you still got to do that research to eke out the errors, and also there's always that risk of, of smaller errors that are, that are going to creep in because not every client is a 100% expert in what they do. They're, you know, think of startups who are just getting it or a new industry where, not, where nobody knows everything about it. You know, there's always a risk or, or indeed, you know, there, there are many people who just are a little bit lackluster in, in their sort of commitment to, um, to their own learning and, and haven't learned everything about their own industry. And errors can creep in. But my biggest concern in all of this is what it is the threat that it poses to the info system. Um, think of that, that it spots an error and reports it back as fact. One bot does that. Another bot comes along, finds the article with the bot's error, takes that as an error, takes that error as fact. It all self-perpetuates. I believe that within five years, misinformation is going to become the default. Now, we know that our, our human-based info system contains a lot of misinformation and conspiracy theory rubbish and so on. That, you know, nobody's claiming that our info system is perfect right now. But, you know, there is a high degree of accuracy in the information that is out there right now. But that is going to be diluted to the point where I don't think we'll be able to trust anything online if we continue down this particular uh, path that we're on right now. AI presents an enormous threat to that. It's going to it's going to destroy something beautiful that that, that we've all built up over the last sort of three or four decades. Right. So I, I I have grave concerns about it. I, I'm in a fortunate position with this. My brother is is actually a pioneer in this industry. Um, basically, my my brother just sort of without getting into too much detail is is. Um, if you think of Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory, he he's kind of you know I I, I grew up in his shadow. Yeah, let's let, let's say I I don't class myself as stupid, but um, next to him, you know, um, I, I'm a, I feel like Penny, you know, <laughs> um, and um, he is, is sort of ranting at me on a on a sort of weekly basis about um, you know the the inefficiencies of current AI that you know that it. it it, it, there's nothing there that is going to achieve self-awareness that is that is going to become genuinely intelligent. It will always just be some kind of tape recorder that just mimics and, and plays it back to you. He's he's developing something that is um, uh, more robust, let's say. That's a that's a good deal more intelligent. I can't go into any great detail about it, but um, you know there is much better AI coming down the line. Um, I will be very keen to see what that does. Um, there will always be risks attached to it, but if the AI is good at what it does, that it's, if you like, it becomes a super intelligent human, um, then I think um, it becomes a much more interesting conversation rather than the big frustrating conversation that it is today. Now, I, I know not everybody shares my views on ChatGPT. I say some people absolutely swear by it, you know. Um, Personally, I, I wish that we didn't have it. You know, I wish that we could just get to a point where, okay, we didn't have it today, and we have something brilliant tomorrow. That the the evolution of, of AI is going to be painful for everyone. Mm. Thank you for sharing the the context and the insights around the future 
projection of what it could, what, what, where we're headed and what it could achieve in the negative. Um, interesting to hear about your brother as well. Mm. So, yeah, I'm going to stay close to you and, and want to hear about what, what's coming down the line from him. Very interesting. And I think your views on ChatGPT, um, yes, not everyone's going to agree with them. However, what, what you're saying rings true for me. It's it's very valid and, and it gives a very um, pragmatic and very clear look at, you know, what it does and therefore the, the, the pitfalls of it. So mm. thank you for sharing that with me. Um, I can't believe how long we've been talking. I, I And I haven't even got to the point where I get to ask you the, the, the million-dollar question. So I'm going to ask you that now. Yeah. What does six, being six-star mean to you? It's the biggest question you can ask me, and I, I actually don't know. <laughs> I think that it's something to do with, um, and I, I think you're talking about sort of, about having that X factor in your business, yeah, about having that sort of. Well, six star could be that, yes, it, it, but it's about, it, you know, if we focus on the leader, the individual, because you're you're the one that's driving your business mm. and your business is a reflection of you. So if you yeah. think about it that way, so you don't have to focus too, too much on just, you know, the business being six star, but what about you? What does that mean to you? So do uh, do you mean um, what does it mean what 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 do you have to bring to the business or what does the business have to offer in order to sort of have that quality I think is what yeah I'm exactly yeah. yeah but focusing on the individual first so I I think to to use another quote from Einstein uh, that that does the rounds everywhere um, it's not that I'm smarter than anyone else it's that I stay with the problem longer. I think to me that that comes above everything. Um, when I started writing, I had a tendency to think, well, I've written it now, it'll do. And didn't sort of, you know, critically evaluate it necessarily. And there'd be ideas that there were that were kind of stuck half stuck in my head and, and you know, wasn't thinking of the context in which the, the end user would 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 review it, that that kind of thing. Um, so for a long time now, I have learned to stay with the problem longer. If I've got to write a headline, I'll write 50 versions of it first and then choose the best one and then go through an optimization process once copy goes live, etc. Now, to, to apply that within a wider business context, it's just that principle of not accepting the first answer, of knowing that in every single thing you do, in every second of every day, there is always improvement. Um, and never, ever being satisfied with what you've done. Yeah, because literally everything in any field of endeavor, every single thing that anyone has ever produced is improvable. And of course, I mean, I'm, I'm a chronic perfectionist and, you know, to, to my own detriment. Um, and you have to come to that point where, you know, you can hit a diminishing return and say, well, this will do, this will, you know, this is this is good enough for us to put out there. And then we can optimize it as we go. Of course, you have to have that that discipline, but um, it starts with that refusal to accept anything less than your own best. I think that that is something that sets, whether it's the entrepreneur or the business, that sets um, the great and the good apart from the mediocre. I really, really love that. Mm. Thank you. James, it's been an absolute joy to talk to you. I, I, we've been going over an hour and it's, time has just flown. It's been so brilliant. I want to keep talking to you, but um, I'm going to respect the, the, the listeners' ears and uh, <laughs> say that we'll we'll have to, like, wrap it up. Uh, a yeah. couple of things, a couple more questions. Uh, do you have something, is there a way that people can get in touch with you or something that you'd like to offer them? Um, but, yeah, so um, you can go to my website, jamesthecopywriter.co.uk, uh, not .com because another James beat me to registering that within by five minutes, and this was 10 years ago, and I'm still fuming about it. Um, so jamesthecopywriter.co.uk. Um, on there, uh, if you scroll to the bottom of the page, you'll see three books I've written, and you can download any of them free of charge. So uh, Do You Talk Like That at Home is a guide to writing simple conversational copy 
Direct Mail 101, uh, I wrote with a guy called David Amor, who's a leading light in the direct marketing world about sort of, you know, using direct mail in the 21st century. Um, and there's one called Before You JFDI, which is about putting some plans in place for your marketing campaign. Um, but we're talking mostly to here today about copywriting. So, you know, have a look at Digital Black Cloud at Home uh, in particular. They're all free. You can download as many as you like and, uh, and I won't spam you forever. Um, so, yes, have a look at that. Thank you. I'll, I'll go and do that for sure. I mean, I've I've so loved hearing your voice and and you know talking with you today. I'm going to go and read some more of your stuff for sure. Um, right. Final final question as we wrap up: Is there a little gold nugget or a tidbit or something you'd like to leave our listeners with um, today? Oh, gold nuggets. Oh. I mean, I think I've given you all of my best advice here today. So um, yeah, never stop learning. Um, it's a cliche, but I, I was quite resistant for a long time to personal development. Uh, I only switched on to it really, you know, in, in my mid to late forties. Um, I started going to marketing events, you know, sort of soon after I set up the business, but, um, that's learning the mechanics. There's, there's a whole scene of personal development about understanding your own mind and your own motivations, um, you know, and, and and how business works, you know, that that most of us don't bother to access. We we live in an age now. You know, I saw something on Facebook that said, you know, if 40 years ago um, you've been able to project into the future and be told you'll have this handheld device that contains all of the information in the world, but you'll use it to argue with strangers and share pictures of cats, you know. Um, all of the information that, that we could ever want is there for us, and it's very readily accessible. Most of it is free, uh, you know, and the rest of it you won't pay much for, and we don't bother to access it. Um, as I say, it took me years to realize that, and I have been um, able to make much more of a difference in my own business and to my clients as a result of you know, reading from people who've been there before. Um, and there's one other thing I'd like to add to that as well, if I can, which is um, I think that as we get older, we have a tendency to become quite arrogant and to assume that we've been around the block and we know it more. And again, this is something I've certainly been guilty of and I've only come to in very recent years that younger people have so much um, to teach us. Um, my own son is is 22 and I'm learning from him all the time. You know, he's going through a process of, of modeling, of learning sort of people who've been through the steps he wants to do and, you know, obsessively looking at their career paths and what have they done and, and so on, you know. And he, he, he has a sense of purpose that I never had. Um, I've been recently reading a book by um, Stephen Bartlett, who's a, a UK entrepreneur on Dragon's Den, who's now about 30. Uh, he's written a book called Sexy Happy Millionaire that he wrote in his late 20s, which is simply incredible. His, his insight is unbelievable. And it it's not just that you know we underestimate the speed at which people can accumulate wisdom, but also a younger generation knows things that we never will. You know, we're talking now, you know, I'm not a digital native. I'm of the generation that grew up in the analog world and had to adapt our ways to digital. Digital natives who are far more sort of naturally au fait with the way the world is now developing have so much to teach us. But in our, you know, from our 40s, 50s, we become that little bit resistant to um, to new knowledge, to new ways of working and thinking. And to you know, we, we just assume, look, you're just a you're just a kid. What on earth do you know? And that is an enormous mistake that that we're all guilty of making. I think. Thank you for saying that. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and uh, I, I love that you've raised it and and framed it in that way. We definitely need to keep learning, and definitely from our young people. And there's so much that I that I learn even from my twelve year old boys. Yeah. And I it had to you know put aside that pride or that that arrogance that, oh, I've been through so much, you know, I know it all. No, I don't, absolutely don't. And, yeah. uh, and, so and thank we never will, yeah. No, no, we never will, exactly. What a brilliant way to, to finish up. Thank you so much for 
your time today, James. I've really loved having you on the show, uh, all your insights, your journey, your wisdom, and speaking to a true creative. I, I so appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.